Number one. Lots of people are afraid of accessing the deep web for themselves. Be that because they don't want to see some of the messed up things they've heard about, or because one wrong step can, in theory, land you in a whole heap of trouble. Accidentally clicking on a disguised child porn site, which automatically downloads some illegal images onto your computer, for example. I guess that's why so many people are interested in hearing about the deep web. It's still a pretty big mystery to most internet users, but a pretty interesting one at the same time. I, however, was never too worried about accessing it myself. It's mostly a pretty boring place, and most of the crazy things you hear about are either massive exaggerations or just downright myths. That's not to say there aren't some seriously messed up things out there though. Here's an example of a real site on the deep web, which I came across a while ago now. The site in question was called Acid Splash, followed by a seemingly random assortment of numbers. So something like acid underscore splash 764390, you get the picture. When following the link to the site, you arrived at a cover page that simply had the site's crude little logo and the slug line because ugly on the inside should mean ugly on the outside. Clicking on the logo brought you to the main site. Across the top bar were a few links to follow, such as about, services, members videos, pictures, and all the like. Despite the crappy logo on the cover page, this site was pretty well laid out, fairly professional looking for deep web standards. In the about section, it explained that the site was for those with a burning desire for revenge. Basically, it was a site for angry users to get revenge on anyone they liked, in a very particular way. For a price, they'd be able to pick a target to be the victim of an acid attack, ruining their lives forever. They kept on using the word justice, I assume to try and convince users to use their services and to rationalise their sick business. The attacks would be recorded, and the videos would then be uploaded to the site, where other users who paid a Bitcoin membership fee would be able to view them. At the bottom of the page were several sample videos. Each video was titled a person's name, followed by the word Splash. Cindy Splash, for instance, and had a short description underneath, thanking a username for making use of their service. All of the short sample videos would follow the same formula. They would record themselves stalking the victims, filming them from hidden spots so that the people being taped weren't aware they were being watched. The footage was just of the people going about their everyday lives and just doing normal things. Shopping, hanging out with friends, walking to work, etc. After a few minutes of this, the video would cut to the inside of an empty apartment. All you could see were a person's gloved hands, preparing a beaker of what I assume to be hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. The end of each video would be of the victim, filmed from a distance, as the cameraman slowly approaches them when they are alone and vulnerable. The camera gets uncomfortably close, and you can see the shock on the person's face as the cameraman shouts something at them, always in a language I didn't understand. The acid would then be thrown in the victim's face, their screams clearly audible, as the guy holding the camera ran from the scene. Even if treated immediately, such an attack would completely destroy a person's face, leaving them with horrific facial burns and scars for the rest of their lives, and potentially even blinding them. Just before fleeing, the camera would linger slightly on the victim's face as they clutched it in agony the acid slowly burning away at their skin. According to the site's About section, the members' videos put a much larger focus on the stalking aspect, with some of the videos being over an hour long so that the viewer could get really into the lives of the victims before they were ruined forever. The videos appeared to be from a variety of countries, suggesting that this was either a semi-global organisation or that the people behind the scenes were willing to do a lot of travelling to carry out the attacks. They may have also paid freelance criminals to do the jobs for them, and film the attacks. The outcome's all the same. 
All of the victims in the videos I watched, bar one, were female. I don't know if it's some sort of weird sexual fetish that leads people to support the site, or just a love of watching people suffer. More likely it's a combination of the two, some sort of sadistic fantasy. Admittedly, I watched all of the free sample clips, out of morbid curiosity I suppose. I'd say there are plenty of normal, well-adjusted people who'd watch this stuff and still condemn it. Look at the amount of people who actively search car crash videos on YouTube. It's hard to look at, but sometimes even harder to look away. I still use the deep web on occasion. It's useful for a few things provided you know where to look, and you quickly learn what links to avoid. But if you go looking for shit like this site, you're bound to stumble across some pretty eye-opening stuff eventually. That much I can tell you. Number 2 There's a site on the deep web called The Waiting Room. All it is is a constant live feed of a table. The live stream is in black and white, grainy and from an elevated angle, similar to CCTV footage. Because of the way that the camera is focused on the table, it's difficult to tell what kind of room it is. It could be anywhere from a basement to an abandoned hospital. I found the site about a year ago. The first time I went on it, there was a man tightly bound to the table with straps. He was gagged and blindfolded. As crappy as the feed was, I could just about make out his chest rising and falling as he breathed and his head wiggling around. He was hooked up to an intravenous drip. In the top right corner of the screen was a number. 104. I figured this whole thing was just a prank for deep web newbies, and that it was just some pre-filmed footage playing on a loop. I came back to the site two days later, and the first thing I noticed was that the number had changed. It now said... 106. The position of the intravenous drip had shifted a little, and the guy was shifting his head and feet. The longer I watched, the more it became obvious that this was not pre-recorded footage. This was 100% live. At some point between the last time I was on the site and this time, somebody must have come in and changed the drip. They were keeping this guy alive, just tied to a table. Unable to move, unable to see, unable to even scream for help. I checked back again at a later point, something like three months later. The site was still up, and the stream was still going. Only this time, it was a completely different person strapped to the table. A female, who, according to the number on the screen, had been in there a couple of weeks. She was wriggling around more than the male I had seen, still putting up a fight. After that, I had seen enough. One thing to note though, is that in text at the top of the site, the creator had said that they were hoping to expand, and have multiple streams running at the same time. They weren't even charging people to view the footage. It's horrific to think that somewhere in the world, right now, there are people being trapped against their will. Suffering in such a terrible way, unable to see anything, say anything, even move. It's difficult due to the quality of the stream to see if they had earbuds in, but for their sake I hope they weren't forced to wear them. Complete sensory deprivation can drive a person insane. Never forget to be grateful for your freedom, and count yourself as one of the lucky ones. Number 3 I'm from the Netherlands, and last year, my friends and I were having a party. I use the word party very loosely. It was just a few stupid 18-year-old dudes getting drunk at one of our friends' places. His family's rich, lived in the Reisvike, and had a house with a good-sized garden. So, when we were hanging at this guy's place, we always had a blast. Eric, the guy whose place we were hanging at, suggested that we explore the deep web together. He had downloaded Tor, and had been looking around on it for the past couple of days, 
and figured it would be fun, just for laughs. Most of us hadn't even heard of the deep web before, so when he explained to us what it was, our drunken asses were totally in. So he shows us all of the common sites that you've probably heard of. After a while, we started going off-road and looking for some obscure, crazy things. We found people selling drugs, a bunch of those hitmen services which look pretty fake, even a site where you could have a box full of actual shit mailed to someone. That one was particularly funny at the time. Still sort of is. We came across a site in Dutch that was selling animals. Not crazy, exotic animals, but like cats and dogs. Okay, that's pretty weird. Why would you need to be selling such normal pets on the deep web? We were about to click off and find something more interesting, when a chat box popped up on the screen, asking us what sort of animal we were looking for, and if we needed any help. Drunk off our asses, we decided to play along with this random guy who must have run the site, and since he sold dogs, we typed to him in English, can you send a bunch of bitches around to my place ASAP? Our country is highly proficient in English, so he definitely understood our innuendo. He told us to stop wasting his time and to get off the site. We decided to ask a legitimate question. Why are you selling cats and dogs on the deep web? The guy's response really surprised us, as we didn't see it coming. He told us that all of the pets for sale on the site were stolen from their previous owners, and then sold on for profit. The guys behind the site would go around to people's houses, wait for their dogs to be let out into the yard, steal their designer pets, and then sell them at a major discount. We asked him why he did it, and he said it was surprisingly lucrative. Since some breeds can be really expensive and sought after, there was a lot of demand. They also stole cats, which he said were much easier to get a hold of, since owners kept much less of an eye on them. What was our response to this? Well, we were drunk, so we started calling him an arsehole. He didn't respond well to this, calling us pussies and saying we'd never say such a thing to his face. He wasn't eloquent or anything, he just typed like some sort of thug. At one point, Eric, who was typing, was saying that if the guy had any pets of his own, he would realise how messed up what he was doing was, and that he'd fuck up anyone he caught trying to steal his cat. There was a slight pause before the guy simply replied, Okay, I'm coming to get it, and you won't catch me. Bullshit, we all thought. Firstly, what are the frigging odds that this jerk-off would ever do anything? On top of that, what are the odds that he even lives close by enough for it to be worth his while? So we figured, screw it. We kept berating him and calling him an asshole in a variety of ways. After a while, he stopped responding with his empty threats, and just went silent. We kept typing, but since he wasn't responding anymore, we got bored quickly. A week or so passed, and I get a call from Eric that chilled me to the damn bone. Turns out that the guy's threats weren't so empty after all. His mum had gone to let the family cat, Cubus, into the house the night before, but it was nowhere to be seen. She figured that it just wanted to stay out for the night, so the family went to bed and thought no more about it. The next morning, when she opened the front door, right there on the doorstep was Cubus, almost totally skinned. It may have taken them a while longer to realise that the bloody mess was their cat, had the skin and fur of the tail not been left on as to help them identify it. The guy must have traced Eric's IP address, located his house, waited to find out which cat was his, and then caught it when no one else was watching. Maybe he was planning on stealing it, but figured that the breed wasn't worth taking, so he'd just send a message instead. We also don't know whether he really did live close by, or got someone else to do his dirty work. The thought of him living close by is pretty horrifying, as is the thought that he was watching Eric's house, or at least someone was. We didn't fully realise who we were messing with. Sorry, Cubus.
Hi guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, these ones took a while to find actually. It's uh, it's really difficult to track down new deep web stories nowadays. But uh, either way, I hope you enjoyed these ones. And if you did, then hey, super smash that like button for me. I'll have another video coming for you guys very soon. But until then guys, stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.